My poem begins with a short epigraph from Edgar Mitchell, an Apollo 14 astronaut. From behind the rim of the moon emerges a sparkling blue and white jewel, Earth. Out of sight. Zooming to Novaya Zemlya, Russia's Arctic National Park looks pristine. The car is sea sealed by a clean sheet of ice. Following further, we might see polar bears, Arctic foxes, bearded seals. What we wouldn't see beneath that closed door, amongst Arctic char, lion's mane jellyfish, moccasin and beluga whales, would be K-27, a leviathan 360 feet long, its twin nuclear hearts in stasis, bowels filled with bitumen and concrete. Nor would we see the other 14 reactors, 17,000 containers of radioactive waste, 735 pieces of contaminated machinery that bask beneath the surface of this shallow sea. We label this wilderness a sanctuary, call it Pearl of the Arctic. This is Where Once She Danced from Planet in Peril by Fly on the Wall Press. Where once she danced, beyond the sleepy dapplings of the mangroves, trailing lazy limbs into the drowsing waves, across the turquoise crests of placid currents that lap up to the gently sloping shore, out past the breakers' ivy frothing, beneath the rolling drifts of white cap spray, once I saw her dance her head encircled brightly in blooming rubicons and blazing saffron stars. Tresses dressed with every hue their body, ribbons streaming emerald and vivid sapphire blue, peacock feathered tendrils trailed behind her, a giant clam gasped deep and wide with awe. Humpback whale came to slowly drift above her. Their voices joined the wind to sing her praise. Seals paused to frolic in her sway. A Maui wrasse gliding past took the spill. And later, as the evening stretched and lingered, slow to let the day slip to the sea, the sun came slanting through that glassy window to spread a crimson blanket for her sleep. Leaping with first light came the dugongs, and dolphins circling idly by her side, dragonfish nimbly flitting through her fingers, Neptune's cock sponge brushing past her toes, as clownfish coaxed a path around her shoulder, where her braids were twined with amber and with rose. Turtles grazed on grassy rolling borders, porcupine rain rippling in the flats. Ribboned pipefish nibbled at the treats she offered. Mantis shrimp and krill came pick picking at the crumbs. In her garden, suffuse with every colour, bottle brush, bordered staghorn, horn skirting fern. But storms came to dash her radiant features. Her gorgeous tresses have all turned white with woe. Her feathered boas are falling all around her, blossoms fading from magenta, fuchsia, rose. Angelfish in anguish bow their heads down, swimming hard against a swiftly rising tide. She is drowning in a sea awash with cobalt. Deadly nettles fill the channels where she plays. Her lovely limbs are shackled down with plastic. Her lungs are laced with deadly manganese. A crown of thorns to pierce her pretty head. 
a bed of flesh to lull her in her dreams. Her cherished creatures perish all around her in the clutch of slowly simmering seas, where once beyond the dappling of the mangroves, beneath the drowsing waves and turquoise crest, way out past the breakers idly frothing, I saw her dance, her head encircled brightly in blooming rubicons and blazing saffron stars, tresses dressed with every hue fair budding, ribbons streaming emerald and vivid sapphire blue. Hello, I'm Joanna Lilly and I'm sitting here in my back garden in Whitehorse in Yukon in Canada, which is uh, up next door to Alaska. And I'm going to be reading my poem called Specimen from the very wonderful uh, anthology, Planet in Peril. And I just want to say a couple of things um, before I get going. One is that you can probably see my dog Pepper there in the background, and uh, just in case she starts moving around. And the other thing is I'm very, very grateful to be living here on the traditional territories of the Kwanlindan First Nation and the Tehan Kwachin Council. And now I will read my poem, and as I say, it's called Specimen, and it's inspired by the spotted green pigeon, which unfortunately is now extinct. There will come a time when there are only two humans left in the world, and they will be dead. You, perhaps, and me. We will have been shot and carefully cleaned. We will be skinned. All our creases and tears emptied of viscera. Our surfaces salted sulfured, potassium carbonated. We will be mounted, glassed in separate collections as far apart as London and Lincolnshire. No one will remember to write down where we came from. One of us will be misplaced. There will be only one human skin left in the world and it will be yours. Many won't believe you are a unique species. They will think you are a juvenile of an existing genus or a deviation. You will be taken to the World Museum in Liverpool. You won't have been to Liverpool before. You will never leave. Your legs, removed for stuffing, will be put back on the wrong way round. Someone will paint your glass eyes red because they heard that was the colour your eyes once were. After 200 years, there will be round. Someone will paint your glass eyes red because they heard that was the colour your eyes once were. After 200 years, there will be tests. Three short DNA sequences on the mitochondrial 12S gene will prove you are a distinct species. A specimen, moreover, of the legendary Homo sapien from the Plastitronic Age, alleged architect of annihilation. Thank you very much. Planet in Peril, a discarded dragnet flung out to sea, plastic fragments that will drift aimlessly, left to haunt the waves for eternity, only dismissed with stark reality. Every flower that wilts for lack of bee, a green space encaged in destiny. Every piece of paper plucked from a tree, lies scrunched and crumpled irrespectively. Oppressing nature's delicate beauty, the impact we have so radically. Open your eyes, there are no planet B. This is the world that the future will see, a planet in peril, and it's because of me. Blueberry morning. It's a January frost-free miracle in my North Carolina supermarket where it's a two-for-one blueberry sale, so I add them to my shopping cart. Secure from the freaky outside cold, the Chilean bluettes look perfectly cozy in their crystal clear plastic containers. They look so comfy, I wonder if they still dream of summer in South America. As I eat my morning oatmeal, I ponder the adventure stories of this well-traveled fruit. Could it tell me about the toxic sprays that made it picture perfect? Was it picked by a shaker machine or by campesinos breaking their back? How was its 
4,136-mile plane trip from the Chilean farm to Florida that it enjoy its 869-mile truck trip up the interstate. How many miles per gallon does a Chilean blueberry get? Sometime this summer, local pick-your-own blueberries will ripen on nearby vines, and they can take a shortcut across the river to my morning bowl. Then breakfast will be more enjoyable when my mind doesn't have to digest so many perplexing questions. Hi, I'm Katie Slattery, coming to you from the west of Ireland. Telephone wires. A kettle of swallows sitting patiently, thriving in the dusk no more. Where did they assemble before the wires? Alignment so natural in all of nature's coding, nothing seems as ingrained. Putting on the same play every year, no variation from the script. Each final act more solemn. Will their next performance be a tragedy? Every year my heart grows heavier, with fewer actors every spring. If only I could rewrite the finale, lift my pen and replenish their flight, protect them from the destruction man has wrought. Alas, the wiring is too strong. Thank you. 240 grams. This poem was written at the research lab at Lord Howe Island, the World Heritage Island, off the east coast of Australia. Uh, it comes with a photograph I took, which will be explained in the course of the poem. It starts with a quote from the BBC News from a couple of months before I was there. Seabirds are starving to death on the moat Lord Howe Island. Their stomachs, are so full, their stomachs are so full of plastic, there's no room for food. Inside, I sought through a tide line poured into a bucket, searching for nurdles in brown detritus, mostly organic, find soft brown globes, small air bladders, mostly stems. Colours are best. I can't detect the plastic transparencies. Outside, I weigh a pendulous shape, a defrosted shearwater, the drama needing more weight. I measure the wing, a wonder structure never put to use, skimming the ocean or soaring in the ballet of courtship, living life to the full. The chick crawled its way out of a dark burrow two metres underground and died in the blinding light. His calipers on the bill then start enthusiastically plucking its belly, feeding a garden pillow fight, feathers flying. I thrust some into a small plastic bag, noting details for chemical testing. My steel blade cuts into the skin, but being too gentle, unused to this work, I slice through the connected tissue again and again, struggling to find the stomach sac amongst the dense architecture. It's empty, easy to miss. I push aside the glistening worminess, the moist earthiness we share. Cold nests inside instead of warmth. The rope intestine breeds distant cousins we have commandeered, our other half. The world within our world sharing our deep history of symbiosis, deserving nourishment, thousands of species inside and outside, outnumbering our own body's cells. Meanwhile, tissue, fat and blood wedge intimately under my nails. I carve the nuggety gizzard, peel back its border, open it out like a fig, revealing small black thorns. Cuttlefish beaks. Separate the microplastics piece by piece. Discards of our cult prove our worship is reckless and that there are no islands anymore. I slip them in a bag, but they stick to my fingers, slippery with slime, favouring disgust over negligence. How to make the out of sight manifest? A window onto terror from my home. 600 k's due west, feeding the great Pacific Gaia, 
the anonymous centres and edges of frag. Cruelty can be ecstatic, forgetful, or as casual as littering, letting storm drains do their work, vomiting plastic into the sea, eroding to tiny and tinier farting phenols and phthalates. 20th century anxieties are being revised and updated. The sky blooms a beautiful weight of blue. An endemic coral wall rose overhead, flashing black and white, the colours which reality once scoured to the horizon. I find myself stroking the dark head without thinking. Reading my poem from Planet and Tarot, Villanelle for my planet. Treat your home with love, it will sustain you. Untended, webbing can tear. A net's weave is strong when its connections are true. Our actions have changed things more than we knew. We haven't treated our surroundings with care. Treat your home with love, it will sustain you. Stories are told using many a hue. Facts about deeds not always laid bare. The net's weave is strong only when its connections are true. The lies we were told by greedy oligarchs grew. The practice of depletion from pillage to profit, not fair. Treat our home with love, it will sustain you. Let us rip open the veil and see through. We need all be invested in our habitats fair. A net's weave is strong when its connections are true. Time has come for action that's new. Create stewardship in which we all have a share. Treat home with love, it will sustain you. A net's weaves as strong as its connections are true. Thanks. This is my poem, Fruitless, from the anthology Planet in Peril. She carries the can through the avenue of fruitless cherry trees, to her garden, where flowers die daily in their beds, where roots despair and concede defeat, where reckless shoots scorch and shrink, where earth's parched lips gape in vain, thirsting for the taste of rain. Her well of hope in man and God drain dry, no drop of faith in politicians' power to make the climate change. She lifts the lid, dips her brush's tip, and with the softest strokes begins to bring her lawn to life again. Each brittle tuft rising to her tender touch, and brown becomes green again for a day. you have felt them on the beaches, and you do, making plastic grenades that pulse and twist, punching the snatchers of hungry mouths and starving them cold, Trojan. But still you send more, shivers of oil creep over the top, testing the waves in a silent smear of man's manipulation, a slick cold colour in a jet black suit, a coffin. You cut them sometimes, capture their bodies in wires and rope, fins and faces seared by curves of steel, broken skin, broken trust, no man's land. Then when it's done, you scour graves, harvesting what's left behind, seagull feathers, coloured shells, trophies from the other side, the war dead of this tiny town. Isis turquoise, lazulite, sheet glass. Ice is polar raft on Mirror Lake, birthing platform, snow den. Ice is bear bed, hunting ledge, climbing crevice, trapper cabin. Ice is skewer perch, ptarmigan camouflage, snowmobile track. 
sled road, pack, drift, flow. Ice is summer meltwater, beluga, carving, snow crab, willow tree, dwarf birch. Ice is dolerite cliff, dovekies and cope pods. Ice is coal field, mine shaft, 24 hour, night. Ice is permafrost, diamond white. Vault of seed rice, wheat grass, rye. Ice is sapphire. Ice is satellite station, ski track, cruise route. Ice is gas field. Ice is sari, ivernik, tuvac. Ice is berg, dry dock. Pinnacled, wedge, tabula, fractured, glacier. Ice is history, Yermak, Erebus. Ice is ecosystem, creeping, thaw, shrinking, methane, sink. Ice is sea, rising. Coccolithophores, with acknowledgements to the amoeba in the room, Lives of the Microbes, by Nicholas P. Money. Your protists, meaning, from Greek, the very first, and your surface is textured like a golf ball. Thanks to the electron microscope, we can observe dozens of plates or scales, coccoliths, berry stones, crystal lattices extruded from inside the cell and conjured from calcium carbonate, your armour, and perhaps a lens with which to focus light upon the chloroplasts where you conduct your photosynthesis, drifting and working the ocean's sunlight zone. Your trillions of white specks control the global climate. Your blooms, population explosions, cover a million square kilometres of ocean tracked by scientists using satellites. Aquamarine underwater clouds. By making your chalky plates, you protists take carbon from the CO2 in seawater and when you die, it falls with you to rise through time as the white cliffs of Dover. Better yet, your vast clouds of chalk-covered cells increase the reflectance of light from the sea. Also, when your cells die, they release DMS, dimethyl sulfide, that aids cloud formation by acting as a seeding agent, further promoting global cooling. A lovely, virtuous circle, cycle, which, me, which we may very soon break by pouring yet more CO2 into the atmosphere, acidifying oceans. Let us bless all the blooms of coccolithophores that stabilise the climate as you flutter to the seabed in a marine snowfall. Thank you for watching and happy World Environment Day.